Hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Advanced EDI Reading X12. Before we begin, let's go over a few housekeeping items. If you're on the line and you've not yet connected to the webinar, click the link in your confirmation email. Your browser may prompt you to download and run a file. When you're connected, you should see the presentation on your screen. If you have questions, you can send them via WebEx's chat function. Please take a moment and find the chat bubble icon in the upper right corner. You can type and send questions throughout the presentation, and we'll compile them at the end and take time for answers. As a reminder, although we will cover some basic information in this webinar, we will also delve into more advanced X12 concepts. This webinar is intended to clarify everyone's understanding of what X12 is and the logic behind how it works, as well as how to apply this knowledge in real scenarios. The webinar includes elements that should interest vendors, payers, and providers who want to use raw X12 data for troubleshooting purposes. This webinar is being recorded, and a copy will be made available to all attendees after the event. Now it's time to begin. My name is Sarah Vandermolen, and I will be your presenter today. Let's start by giving you an idea of what you can expect from the session. First up, we're just going to take a moment and define a couple of terms. I'm a big fan of knowing that when I say a phrase or a word, that you guys are thinking of the same thing I am. Next, we'll go over the X12 structure and how it's put together and why it's put together the way it is. After that, we're going to go into something called the implementation guide. I'll be explaining this a little more later, but this is a critical part to working successfully with X12. And then lastly, we're going to do some uh, real scenario style troubleshooting using some X12 reports. And we'll take all this information that we've been talking about and put it into some scenarios that you might actually encounter in real life. So first up, let's, let's take a look at some of those terms. The first term is the most basic one. I just feel like I have to cover it every time, though. EDI is electronic data interchange. And EDI is really just information going back and forth electronically. There's lots of different industries that rely heavily on EDI, and uh, healthcare just happens to be one of them. Transaction. When I say the word transaction, I'm referring to a piece or a package of data that's being transferred electronically. And there's lots of different types of transactions. Claims are perhaps the most well-known. There are acknowledgement reports that come back. There are eligibility requests and prior authorizations and attachments. And all of these are examples of transactions. Now, since this was in the title, I figured I might as well explain it. ANSI is the American National Standards Institute. ANSI is a national level organization that has been tasked with standardizing electronic transactions. And they actually do this for a number of different industries, uh, healthcare being one of them. Now, ANSI doesn't itself do all of the on-the-ground work to create the standards and create the guides that tell us how to implement them. What they do is they have asked a sub-organization still on the national level called X12 to create those standards. So when we talk X when we talk X12 standards, we're talking about a set of rules put together by X12 that say this is how we're all going to do this electronic EDI stuff to make sure that we're being as efficient and standardized as possible. Now, they don't just come up with the rules. X12 also comes up with implementation guides. And these are all about how to put the rules into practice because uh, any of you who deal with EDI or electronic stuff may know, saying that you're going to do something is one thing, but it's quite another thing to say where in the transaction it goes, under what circumstances it is included, how it's formatted. All of those different things are addressed in the implementation guide. Something else that's going to come up is version. Now, there's two different ways that the term version can come about uh, or can be put into practice. So, the most generic form of it is just saying the version of the standard. And, and right now, the entire industry pretty much is on version 5010. However, there's also a version code that goes inside a claim file or actually every type of transaction to identify the version it's running off of. This is an example of what it looks like. The colors are mine. I added that part. The pink part, that is 
the generic version I was just talking about. So as you can see, this one is a 5010 version. Uh, presumably the next version, if all goes well, will be 7030 uh, many years down the road. And so 7030 version codes would start 007030. The green part is a document number. Because I mentioned there are lots of different types of transactions, uh, there's a different document number for each transaction. This one happens to be the document number for a claim, a professional claim. And since, because each transaction has slightly different things it's trying to accomplish, it might have different types of information, the rules have to be slightly different for each one. So this document number in combination with the version tells us which set of rules the transaction is supposed to be compliant with. The last bit is the addendum or errata. And after the version and, and document have all been finalized, if there are any other updates or changes that need to be made, then they will publish an addendum. And so putting the addendum number in there will signify that this transaction does take that addendum information into account. And then lastly, acknowledgement reports. There are lots of different types of acknowledgement reports, and these are all sent in response to some kind of transaction. Regardless of what type it is, if you're sending EDI, you should be getting some kind of response from the receiver to let you know that they got it and give you a status as to what they're doing with it. Now, the acknowledgement reports I'm going to be focusing on in this particular webinar are the ones that come back typically in response to a claim. Now that we've covered a couple of terms, let's jump into the overview of X12 structure. And the first thing up is going to be the envelope. So if you think of a just a regular paper business envelope, we're kind of talking about something very similar. Each electronic transaction has a, an electronic envelope that encapsulates and surrounds the data content. If you want to think of it, uh, the content is like maybe the payload, whatever terminology you're comfortable with, but it, the reason you're sending the file is inside the envelope. Now we've got three main pieces to this envelope structure. If you look on the example on the right, at the very top and the very bottom, we've got this ISA and IEA. This is the interchange control header and footer. So there's something at the top and something at the bottom, and everything in between is part of that envelope. Now, the ISA IEA is really basically just giving us transmission information. It's like an address on an envelope. It's going to have information about who the sender is, who the receiver is, a date timestamp, a tracking number, things like that. It's just basically how does it get from point A to point B. The next one is the GS to GE. This is a group control header and footer, and this one has a group level, and usually in real life this is a batch level information. Now there can be more than one group in each ISA to IEA section. As you can see here in this example, I have two. In, in this example, we're going to pretend I've got two different batches. And each batch is surrounded with a GS at the top and a GE at the bottom. This one is also going to have some basic identifying information. We'll see sender, we'll see receiver, we'll see a version number so we know what kind of transaction we're dealing with. And we'll see a tracking number that tracks this particular group. Inside of those, we get an ST to SE and this is a transaction set header and footer. And so each, let's call it a payload again, each payload is going to be surrounded by an ST at the top and an SE at the bottom. And this is going to have a transaction level uh, identifier, again, something for tracking, and it's going to count the number of segments inside that transaction set so that we know if we've got the entire thing. Now, all of this is based on a concept called nesting. For anyone who's not familiar with that, I've got a visual for you. It's the Russian nesting dolls. So I have one myself that uh, I used to play with as a kid. These things are really fantastic. The smallest one, let's, let's tie this into our example. Let's say the smallest one here is our ST to SE. The payload for the transaction is inside that smallest doll. And the, the halves of the doll are encapsulating that transaction. So we've got a top, that's the header. We've got a footer, that's the bottom. The doll kind of gets snicked together, and then the whole thing can go in the next largest one, which is the GS to GE. 
And the GS to GE is, again, completely encapsulating the ST to SE and everything inside it. It's got a top, it's got a bottom. And then the GS and GE with everything inside can go inside the largest of the dolls, which is the ISA to IEA. And again, it completely surrounds all of the stuff inside. I've got one more visual for those of you who don't identify with Russian dolls and that imagery. So let's say that our ST to SE is a paper claim form. And, uh, and then you can take one or you can take multiple claim forms and you can put it in a, uh, a, a batch envelope. We'll, we'll call it a, a, a batch here. And these sort of business level envelopes, they, uh, they can themselves be put into a larger manila envelope. And that whole thing could be shipped off to another destination. So what's inside the ST to SE? Let's start digging into that a little bit. That's the payload. So uh, as you can see here, we, from the upper level down to the lower levels, it kind of takes a general uh, progression. The upper levels are less specific, they're more identifying, and the lower levels are more specific. So we've got billing providers, subscribers, just kind of identifying who we're talking about in the upper layers. And then we've got payer, patient, uh, that's starting to get more specific. And then we start getting down into claim and line level detail. So as you can see, we've still got everything encapsulated by the header and by the footer. Once we're inside of those layers, everything is going to go from more general up at the top to more specific further down. So um, as you can see here, billing provider, subscriber, payer, uh, this one actually has a rendering provider area. The, the other example didn't. I did want to take that moment to just make sure you guys know there are many, many different types of sections that are possible. And they will either be present or not, depending on the type of file you're sending, your specific type of situation. And uh, there, there can be a lot of different factors that will come into play. So we can't show all of them here at once, but some of them will appear and disappear depending on what's happening in that transaction. Okay, so the information inside the claim, it can look a little bit intimidating unless you have some way to figure out what's going on with it. And, uh, and we have this thing called loop segments and data elements, and that's how we use, uh, that, that's how we identify different areas so that we can tell people, I'm looking at this specific point in the file, and then it'll, it'll let them know where that is. Now, I like to call that sort of our version of latitude and longitude, uh, because latitude and longitude is a comparison most people get. It's familiar, and it does help us pinpoint the location of something. So it's very, very similar in X12 using loop segments and elements. Now, the first one is the loop. The loop is the most general of the options. And, uh, and this one, as you can see here, I've got 2010 BA subscriber loop. So every piece of data in the screen uh, to the right, that is all related to the subscriber. And so, in fact, if you look at the top line, you'll see that the first one, there's some patient name information, there's a member ID. The next two lines, we've got some address information, and then we've got, at the bottom line, uh, a date of birth and a gender. So this is all subscriber-related stuff, and it all falls into a single loop. Now, the next one is the segment. And each individual line here is a different segment. Now, when you look at a raw file, it may or may not be split out like this with each segment on its own line. That's something that sometimes you just kind of have to parse it out manually to, to do that. Uh, but even if the information were all run together, you can still tell where segments are beginning and ending because they will always begin with some kind of short code, usually two or three uh, characters, and they will always end with a tilde, which is that squiggly line at the end. So if the N3 uh, line there were run up against the first one, I would still know that the NM1 line ends with the tilde, and the next segment must be the N3 segment. That brings me to the explanation that each of these segments are named after that code at the beginning. So we would say an NM1 segment, or an N3 segment, or an N4 segment, et cetera. 
The other thing I wanted to point out here is that uh, in a raw claim, you can see NM1 and then the data that follows after. You cannot see anything that says this is loop 2010 BA. That's only if you know what you're looking for or if you're putting it through a validator program that's going to kind of split it all out for you. So a lot of people, if they don't have the opportunity to learn about the loops, as they're kind of teaching themselves, they, they start getting used to saying things like NM1IL. The IL in this case is a qualifier that indicates the subscriber, so it's another way of saying the NM1 subscriber segment. Now, that's still valid. It's still a good way to let people know. However, I do recommend getting to know the loops and those designations because it's quite possible, especially with, say, a coordination of benefits claim, to have more than one subscriber segment. So you can have more than one NM1 IL segment. So you can use both, but I, I do recommend having the loop option in your back pocket to help identify in those cases. Now, inside each segment, we also have data elements. And these elements will, uh, will trail out after the segment and provide all the detail that should be going inside that category. And we'll go into each of these with some examples in just a moment. So first up, let's take a look at those loops. This is the exact same example I showed on the other screen, except this time I've got the loop numbers next to the appropriate pieces of information. The first thing I want to show you is that this information and, or these loop numbers are going numerically and alphabetically. So 1000A will be before 1000B and 2300 will be before 2400. So it'll kind of give you a rough order if you're looking at the, uh, the number there. The other thing is that the range of numbers goes from about 1000 to about uh, 2430, 2440, in the 2400 certainly. So if someone says I'm looking at the loop 2300, I know right off the bat I'm probably looking further than halfway down the claim, closer to three quarters uh, of the way down because it's near the end of the possible range of loop numbers. Now if I were to tie this up with the earlier example, we can see here that we're still going with more general information at the top and more specific information at the bottom. And you could call, uh, for example, 2010 AA, you could call that loop the billing provider loop. You could call it the 2010 AA loop. Both are correct. So now let's take a look at some segments. We've got a couple of segments over here on the left and their explanations on the right. The thing I like about segments is that it's, uh, it's actually quite easy in many, many cases to figure out the meaning of the segment just by looking at it. So if we take that first one, for example, the segment is an NM1 segment. And that one is meant for information including name and primary identifiers. So for me, I just think NM is name, one is for primary identifiers. And uh, this, in, in this particular case, I do have a subscriber segment, so it's going to have subscriber name, subscriber ID. But NM1 segments will also do for providers, in which case you'll get the provider name, uh, either billing provider, rendering provider, referring provider, etc. And you'll get that provider's NPI as their primary identifier. If it's a payer, you'll get the payer name and the payer ID. So NM1s are all about names and the first type of ID that we're going to use to figure out who they are. The next one down is a, an REF or REF segment. And REF is for reference information. So again, there's kind of a logical connection there. Reference information and segments, they usually contain secondary identifiers. And uh, so this is going to mean things like tax IDs, social security numbers, PTANs, taxonomy codes. These are all IDs that will help someone identify you. but they're not the primary way that someone is going to be doing that identification. Next down, a DMG is a demographics uh, section. That's pretty self-explanatory. CLM, claim information. Now, one thing that's a little bit misleading about this one is that we might be tempted to think that the CLM segment will contain everything in the claim, but that is not the case. This is going to hold claim level information. So this is the stuff that's only going to appear once on a claim. So this is going to have a patient account number, 
the claim level build amounts. It's going to have the release information about whether benefits assigned and whether the provider signature is on file and things of that nature. The next one down is HI, and that stands for Healthcare Information Codes, and that one actually means diagnosis codes. That's what they mean by healthcare information codes. So there are a couple that, uh, even though the the code has a logical connection to the phrase it's attached to, that phrase may not be the one we're used to using. So there are a couple you might just have to memorize, so you know that HI means diagnosis. After that. Uh, SV1, this is a service line information, and uh, the one thing I wanted to point out about this is that the one is part of the title. It's not a line number. So if you were to have five different service lines, each one of those five lines would begin with SV1 because the one is part of that name. The counting happens elsewhere in the X12 transaction. And lastly, but not leastly, we have DTP, which is a date time period. So again, fairly easy to recognize it based on the code. All right, so that's segments. Let's now delve a little bit into data elements. And data elements are the bits that appear uh, after the segment beginner, and they are going to contain all of the good gory details that we need to figure out what's going on. Now, the data elements are going to be separated by some kind of character. Usually, it's either going to be an asterisk, which is that star, or a pipe, which is the vertical line. And my example below uses asterisks. Now, you can see here I've got this one all diagrammed out so that you can see which uh, positions, and I, I do call them positions, which positions are attached to which pieces of data. And you'll notice that uh, the, after the first asterisk, we get CLM01. A lot of us are lazy. We'll say CLM01. Uh, but uh, forgive me if I say that, that is a, a very industry common type of thing. Uh, so we've got CLM01 after the first asterisk. After the second asterisk, we get CLM02. Now notice that in the third and fourth positions, even though there's nothing in there, they still hold their place. And that's because each piece, like CLM05, should always have the same kind of information in it, so it always has to be in the fifth position, uh, and if there's nothing in three and four, well, too bad. We just hold the space for them with asterisks and keep the data inside blank. Now, the CLM05 is a little bit interesting. There is such a thing with certain data elements uh, as subpositions. This is one of them. When there's a subposition present, there's going to be a different type of separator. Uh, in this case, it's a colon. Usually, it's either going to be a colon or a caret, which is the symbol above the six on your keyboard. And uh, the way we usually talk about this, we've got in the CLM05 subposition 1, we've got this 11. In CLM05 subposition 2, that's the bit in between the colon. So again, if there's no data, uh, we're still going to hold the position. And then CLM05 position, subposition 3, we've got the 1. And when we write it out, Usually how we're going to do it is we're going to do CLM05-1 or CLM05-1. Those are both common ways of indicating that there's a subposition present. Okay, now you might be getting the picture at this point that all of this stuff is very, very detail-oriented and complicated. That's why I wanted to have a section here on the implementation guide. So let's take a look at this. Now, we've got uh, a lot of different things that we need to be able to implement, and some of it is more uh, complicated than it seems at first glance. So we rely heavily on these implementation guides. They do use the national X12 standards and then tell you, here's how you can make it happen. And they, were, they contain all of the requirements, the examples, list of approved values, all of that stuff that you might need to make it happen. And it's very comprehensive. And when I say everything, I mean everything. These are between usually six and 800 pages long. And there is a different one for each transaction type. So I've got a screenshot up here for the professional one. But uh, if you deal with dental claims, you'd want the one for dental. And if you deal with any acknowledgment reports, you would want the ones for those acknowledgment reports. Now, if you are new to the implementation guide uh, or new to X12, there are three points of vocabulary that are absolutely critical to understand. 
required, situational, and not used. And I'm going to give you an example of each one. Required is perhaps the most straightforward one. And uh, I'm looking here at uh, the healthcare diagnosis code segment. And there is a thing in here for usage. And you can see that right there. So the usage says required. So that means that segment has to be there. And if it's not there, then the file is going to get rejected. Again, pretty straightforward. It's after this that it gets more interesting. There are two different ways that situational can play out, and this is an example of the first one. So we're looking at the referring provider name, or NM1 segment, and if we look for the usage, this one does say situational. Now, underneath any situational usage rule, you should see the detail that says when you are and when you are not supposed to be putting this information in. In this case, it says required when the service line involves a referral and the referring provider differs from that reported at the claim level. Okay, that, that makes sense. Now it's this next part I want to highlight. If not required by this implementation guide, may be provided at the sender's discretion but cannot be required by the receiver. So if you don't need to put in a referring provider name based on your criteria or based on your situation and the criteria, uh, you can still put it in the claim, but the receiver just can't, they can't require that from you. So that's the first way that situational can play out. Let's take a look at the second one. In this case, I've got a PER segment for property and casualty information. And again, usage is situational. The rule says required for property and casualty claims when this information is different, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to go to the last sentence because that's the big one. If not required by this implementation guide, do not send. So this one, there's none of this, uh, well, if you're not required, you can include it anyway. Oh, no. This one says if, you, if this criteria does not require you to send it, you're not supposed to send it at all. Sending in a situational segment or piece of information if you don't fit the criteria could be cause for rejection. It depends a little bit on how the payer is set to edit the files that come in and what level of detail they're looking for, but there are some payers where that will cause a rejection. So it is very important to know the difference. Another thing about required and situational before we move on is that uh, it, we were looking at all of that on the segment level, but it's also on the element level. You can see here, this is actually a continuation of that same PER segment we were just looking at. And now we're looking at PER01, PER02, PER03, et cetera. And next to each one of those, there's a usage. Now you'll notice some of those usage indicators say required. And you might be wondering, how does that work if the segment itself is situational? Well, the way it works is that if if you are putting in this PER segment, then you need the required fields. If you are not putting in the PER segment, you don't need anything. You just keep the whole thing blank. So if you start it, you have to finish it. If you put together a segment and you, you, you start it off, so it's a PER segment, but you don't include the required fields, it's going to be considered half finished or incomplete, and it will probably cause a rejection because at that point, the systems are going to assume that something got cut off and they don't have the whole thing. I actually have a real life example of this. Uh, fairly recently, I was helping someone to troubleshoot a new system, and uh, their, their system was sending in a segment for other provider information. And they, they started the segment, they had the NM1, they had the qualifier, but the name and ID fields were blank, and those are required. I mean, it's sort of the reason you would send a segment to begin with. So when we were looking at solutions, I told them they had two options. They could either finish the segment with the missing information, or they could remove the segment altogether since it was situational and they didn't meet the criteria to have to send it. Uh, they just couldn't send it in half finished. Back to the main vocabulary, we're just going to hit not used, which uh, this one is also fairly self-explanatory. If it says not used, don't use it. And it might seem a little counterintuitive. Is why do they put in something that says not used if they're not going to use it? But it's, it's good for a couple different things. First off, it can reserve space for future development, but more importantly, it allows them to turn off or get rid of unnecessary pieces without having to shift and recode the entire transaction. If you look at this example, we've got an NM103 that's required and an NM108 that's required, but nothing in between is used. So if you were to get rid of those altogether, 
then NM108 would have to become the new NM104, and the NM109 would have to become the new NM105, and suddenly you're recoding the entire transaction. It's a little easier just to turn the off switch on a couple of those and keep everything else as is. Let's take this information now and start applying it to a few real scenarios. And uh, let's, let's look at it specifically in the context of X12 reports that come back to acknowledge a claim. Now, there are three potential reports that you might get, and these are all used in various ways to uh, respond to uh, an 837. You may not get all of these. The first one, for example, the TA1, is a technical acknowledgement that is uh, it's very general. It only looks at header information. We'll dig deeper into it in a minute. But it's also not a required response. So you may get it, but you may not. Let's say that you do get a TA1. And uh, as long as your, your claim doesn't fail at that level, it's going to continue processing. And the next one you could get would be a 999. This one is a little bit more specific than the TA1. It's still pretty general. It's only looking at batch level information. But uh, at, at this point, we're starting to get into the realm where this is a, a pretty standard response. It's still not required, but you can pretty much expect this one from most payers. Assuming your claim gets past this level as well and it doesn't get kicked out, then we move on to the 277CA. And this one is required, so you should at least be getting this one. And uh, this one is where you get claim level acknowledgement. And this is usually the one people look for for that reason. Now let's dig into that a little more. So first up, we'll just spend a little bit of time on the TA1. The TA1, as I mentioned, being a technical acknowledgement, it's only looking at header information. Now remembering, we looked at uh, the envelopes earlier on, and the header information was up at the top with stuff like sender receiver, timestamps, transmission numbers, and, uh, and version numbers, things like that. That's what the TA1 is looking at. And you can request that the receiver send this to you. Uh, the request may or may not work. It, this whole thing is sort of by payer discretion. So if you request it, you may or may not get it. If you don't request it, you may or may not get it. So use of, of the TA1 is not terribly consistent. However, when you do get a TA1, uh, it is usually because something has been rejected, and it is usually for one of these reasons. Uh, the first bullet there, it says transaction marked as test, but sent to production. There's a little indicator in the ISA segment that says this transaction is test or it's production. And if you've got a mismatch there, that could cause the TA1 rejection. There could be a problem with a sender or receiver ID, and the problem could be a number of different things. It could be the wrong number of digits. It could be missing a dash or have an extra dash somewhere. It could just be that even though everything uh, is technically correct, the receiver just doesn't recognize the sender. They say, well, we don't know who this is. We're not taking that claim in. So those could all happen on a TA1. A problem with the version number, so remembering that code that we had before that has the version, the document number, and the uh, addendum or errata version, uh, if there's something wrong with that, like it's invalid or it's an old version that's not being accepted anymore, those things could cause a rejection. And a problem with the header structure. Uh, the most common one we see for that is for the ISA 06 and the ISA 08 fields. Those two particular fields need exactly 15 characters. So some combination of numbers, letters, and spaces have to equal 15 exactly. If it's too much or too few, uh, you might see a TA1 rejection. As a side note, it is possible for the TA1 to be embedded in other transactions. Uh, such as a 999. So it's possible you may get this level of response in the envelope that identifies it as some other type of transaction. So it, it's not terribly common, but it does happen. So keep an eye out for that. Speaking of the 999, let's take a look at that one. The 999, as I mentioned, is still pretty basic, but it is more detailed than the TA1. The 999 examines syntax and basic structure. So what I mean by syntax is basically, does it follow the rules of the implementation guide? Does it have all the right pieces in the right order? Is the claim complete enough for them to process it more? That's the kind of thing that a 999 will look at. 
Uh, so, for example, you might imagine an invalid character would be a common cause for a rejection at this level. That would be a uh, syntactical error. The 999, as I mentioned also, is pretty standard as a payer response, and it usually comes back pretty quickly. Uh, we're usually talking a matter of minutes or just a couple of hours. They do technically have uh, up to about 24 before it's considered uh, horrendously slow. Now, it is not a required thing for payers to send back. So there are going to be a couple payers where when you send your claim, it's going to skip this step altogether. Uh, so if you're at all curious as to whether your 999 is late or not coming at all, feel free to contact your clearinghouse, including you, Hin, if we're your clearinghouse, and we'd be happy to tell you if that's a normal thing for that payer. Inside the 999, the place we're going to focus on today is mostly the IK5 and AK9, and I'll put a box around it right here. So this is the area that identifies the status at the 999 level. So the most common letters you're going to see here, and if you look at the example, the letter is going to be in the IK501, that first position, and the AK901. And that letter is probably going to be an A for accepted, E for accepted with errors, or R for rejected. There are a couple of other letters that are possible, but these three are by far the most common. Now, the thing with 999s is that the typical industry usage is to accept or reject on the entire batch. So if you sent a claim batch with 10 claims inside, and one of those claims had an invalid character or a segment in the wrong place, one of those syntactical errors, then you could see the entire batch of 10 kicked out for the errors of the single claim. That is the... Uh, the standard usage of a 999, that is how it was intended to be used. There's a couple of payers that are able to reject on the 999 for single claims. And I'll show you how to recognize that when it happens. But just so you know, even though it's nice when they do that, we can't expect everybody to do that because that's not actually what the uh, transaction was intended for. Let's dig into the 999 a little more with a couple of real life examples. These have all been de-identified, but these are uh, all based on real events. So if we were to look at this 999, I recommend that the first step would be to find out what happened. So we're looking for a status. Now we know we're looking for an IK5 and AK9. If you're looking at a parsed out 999, that's probably gonna be like the skinniest portion about two thirds of the way down the transaction. That's, since your eye is going to be naturally attracted to empty space, hopefully your eye should go there pretty naturally. I'm going to highlight it here. Now we can see that the IK501 and the AK901 are showing R's. So that means this, this transaction was rejected. Okay, so now that we know it was rejected, let's see if we can figure out which file or files were rejected. To do that, Going from the top down, look on the left until you see a segment that begins with AK1. AK1 is the first place to look for some kind of identification number. Now, if you look in the AK102, that number that's a 987-654321, that is going to match the identification number from the GS segment in the original transaction. So you can match them that way. Now, in this case, I've also highlighted the CTX segment. CTX segments are not a required thing. They're situational. And when you see one that looks like this, where it's got a CLM01 in the CTX01 position, that CLM01 indicates that this was a claim-level rejection. So this was not a batch-level thing. It was a claim-level thing. And after the CLM01, after that caret, that is going to be the patient account number for the file that was rejected. So in this case, 2Smith002, uh, whichever file that is attached to, whichever patient that's attached to, that's the one that got kicked out. Okay, so now we know it was rejected and we know which file was rejected. Let's figure out what happened. For that, we're going to be looking right here at the IK3 and the IK4. I'm going to have you focus on a couple different places in here. The IK301 is going to be the segment code for the segment and error. So DTP, we learned a little bit earlier that DTP means date time period. So there's a problem with a date. In the IK303, we get 2300. That's the loop. 
So since we know 2300 is claim level, and if you didn't know that, now you do, 2300 is claim level, so it's a claim level date. Well, that already narrows down the field because we know it's not going to be a date of service because that's on the service line level. What happens uh, date-wise on the claim level? Well, we might be looking at a date of last x-ray or date of initial injury, uh, date of admission, something like that. Now, there's an IK-4 in this particular 999. There isn't always. It's a situational segment. But when it's there, it's really quite helpful because the IK-401, in this case, that little three there, that's indicating the data element position of the error. So we know it's BTP03. And then uh, if we look at IK404, which even if you get an IK4, you won't always get a fourth position. But if you do, that's going to be a copy of the data that was an error. So if we were to summarize this, what we know so far, we get patient 2Smith002 had an invalid value of 2018-0230 in the 2300-DTP-03 field. If you had an implementation guide, you could be looking it up at this point and finding out what's going on. The other thing you could do is you could just look at that, uh, that number that was invalid, knowing it's a date, it's going to go year, month, and then day, and you could say, well, you know, um, February 30th of any year is definitely going to be an invalid date. And then you could go into the claim and fix it and resubmit it. All right, let's try one another example together. Uh, so again, we're going to go through the same steps. We're going to start by finding the status. We're looking about two-thirds of the way down for the IK5 and the IK9, and we see it's rejected. Okay, now we need to figure out which one. So again, we're starting from the top and going down until we find the AK1. And if we look at the AK102 position, we see that there is a batch number. And uh, that batch number will tell us which batch was rejected. Uh, this one doesn't have a CTX segment, so we know that this one is not a claim level rejection. This was a true batch rejection, and we can expect that batch 2315648 is going to have to be resubmitted. Okay, so now let's take a look at what happened. Looking for IK3 and IK4. And if we look at the IK3, we can see uh, it's an N3 segment, which, by the way, if you didn't know, that is for a street address. And it's in the 2010 loop. We can see that from the IK303. So a 2010 N3. The 2010 is pretty far up in the claim. That's still in the area where we're identifying uh, providers and subscribers and things like that. In the IK4, we see it's the IK402. Uh, so that's going to be the street address portion of it, not like, say, the state or zip code, which are a little further on in the transaction. And if we look at the IK404, we see the invalid value is PO Box 1000. So again, here's a bit of a summary here. We know that that batch had an invalid value of PO Box 1000 in the 2010 N302. Now, unlike the last one, we can't just look at this one and go, yeah, PO Box 1000 couldn't exist in real life, so therefore it's an error. This one could exist. Now, if we were to go to the implementation guide, however, we would find that the 2010 N302 uh, was in the billing provider area, and provider addresses are not allowed to be PO boxes in those sections. They have to be street addresses. So this is a case where you may need the implementation guide to make sense of the error, because it's not something you can just look at and immediately recognize, not unless you've memorized all of these particular requirements. For the third example, I'm going to give you guys about 30 seconds to try and find the same kinds of information we've been going over together. And again, you're looking for a status. You're looking to find out which uh, batch and or which claim was rejected. And you're looking to at least find the information about what happened. You don't have to be able to interpret it. I just want you to try and locate it on this 999. So we'll do about 20 or 30 seconds starting now. Okay, let's go ahead and start wrapping that up. Hopefully you were able to find at least a couple of the spots. I'm going to highlight them all at once this time. 
And uh, we can see here was rejected. If we go to those green ones, we've got a batch number, but we also have a claim level uh, patient account number. So this was for a specific patient. And then we have some information from the IK3 and IK4 that indicate uh, 2400 loop, SB1, and if you look at the IK401, I threw you guys a curveball. It's the SB101 subposition 2, because remember, SB101 caret or dash, another number, would indicate a subposition. And then the invalid value was 90793. So just summarizing it all, patient Dojon had a, an invalid value of 90793 in the 2400SB101-2 field. So if we were to uh, just look at that and, and try and figure it out on our own, I, I've seen people, they'll, they'll look at this and they'll, they'll look at that, that five-digit number in error and they'll go, oh, you know, maybe that's a zip code. It means zip codes are five digits. But you know what, this is where it's really important to look at the loop and segment because SV1 indicates a service line. There are no zip codes on service lines. What's the other five digit thing that happens on a service line though? It's a CPT code. This particular one, uh, I believe it was an invalid CPT code because it had been discontinued at some point. So, so that is a basic overview of how to get some good information out of the 999. And uh, just so you know, there is going to be a webinar next month where we're going to go in much more detail on this transaction. But for now, we're going to move on to the 277CA, which is the last of those three acknowledgement reports I showed you uh, a little bit earlier. The 277CA is a business rules acknowledgement, and it does go into claim detail. Now, when I say business rules, we're not just looking at is the file formed correctly anymore. At this point, we're also looking to see uh, did they were they able to match the patient to their uh, to their system on the receiving end? Were they able to recognize the provider? If there was a prior authorization number required, was that included? Are additional medical notes required? That's the sort of thing that is going to be happening on a 277 level. The main part we're going to focus on for the 277CA is the status code segment, or the STC status code. And within the status code segment, the STC01 with its three subpositions, that's going to be the main focus. Because in those three subpositions, you can get most of what you need to know out of a 277 at a basic level. And the STC01-1, that is going to be the actual status of the original file. And that code, it'll be either, it'll be somewhere between A0 and A8. A0 to A2 is some form of acceptance where the file is continuing on to process more. And A3 to A8 is rejected uh, uh, in some form or another. In this particular example, this one would have been an acceptance. The STC01-2 is a reason code, and this will give more detail and expand upon the status code that was given. And there are lots and lots of different ones that can be supplied in there. The third subposition, STC01-3, is the entity code. And uh, this one is situational. If the reason code refers to a specific entity who has to be identified, then you'll get an entity code. So just as an example, let's say the reason code was um, uh, entity not eligible for benefits. Well, then the entity code might indicate whether it's the patient or the subscriber, uh, because you could have some different situations where that distinction is important. Now let's take a look at a 277 example. Now I know that's really, really small. So what we're going to do is we're going to highlight the important portion. I'm going to make it a lot bigger. Uh, but it's worth noting that there are more than, there's more than one section where an STC segment is present. Uh, 277s will report statuses on many different levels. Remembering from the earlier stuff where everything in X12 goes from more general up at the top to more specific down at the bottom, I'm going to recommend that when you're reading 277CAs, you go from the bottom up, and that way the first STC code that you encounter is going to be the most specific and detailed one that they are offering in that report. So if I do that here, I've got this section. And I just wanted to show you that that top line, they do include patient details. We've got last name, first name, and a member ID. 
And uh, if you look two lines below that, we've got an STC. And this one, we've got an A2 in the STC01-1. So this particular file was accepted. We know that because A0 to A2 is an acceptance. Anything A3 or above is a rejection of some kind. So if we were to look at a rejected one, again, I'm going to go from bottom up, and I'm going to pick the, the first section with an STC code, and I am going to get this. Again, patient name up at the top there. Two lines down, we get the STC. Now, in this case, the STC01-1 is A7, and that is a rejection code. So we know that the original file in this case did not make it through. Something's going to have to get fixed and resubmitted. So how do we find out what needs to be fixed and resubmitted? Well, unless you can memorize all several hundred codes that are available, you're probably going to need to look up the code somehow. We've got an 88, and we've got an entry code of QC. So let's take a look at what those can mean. There's a couple of different code reference tools that are super helpful. The first one I've got up there, I've got the link for uh, wpc-edi.com. That's the Washington Publishing Company, and they have a free list of, of code sets out there. If you go to their reference page where you can see the different code sets, the two that are going to be applicable in this situation will be the claim status category codes. That will explain your A0 through A8 in further detail. And then just claim status codes. And that one is going to be, uh, like this particular screenshot shows, the code uh, explanation for the one in the STC01-2 position, the one in the middle. So in this case, 88 means entity not eligible for benefits for submitted dates of service. Note, this code requires use of an entity code. So uh, at this point, we would need to try and figure out what that QC meant. Unfortunately, the WPC website does not include the entity codes. So if you need to look one up, there is this other First Coast lookup that we have had success with in the past. You're welcome to try that. And the way they structure their responses is that once you've typed in the code, it'll give you a, a response kind of like what you see here. The description says, Acknowledgement rejected for invalid information. The claim encounter has invalid information as specified in the status details and has been rejected. That is the equivalent of the A7 on the left. All of that is the A7. The next sentence says, entity not eligible for benefits for submitted dates of service. That's the 88. The last sentence just says patient. So now what we know what the QC means, that is patient. Now, as you get more experienced with reading X12 and with looking at entity codes, I think you'll find that you will not need to look up very often. And the reason is that the entity codes, with just a few exceptions, by and large will mirror the qualifiers used in the original transaction. So for example, this is uh, how a QC qualifier is used in a claim. It is used in an NM1 segment to identify that this is patient information. So if you had a QC at, show up as an entity code in a 277, you could go back to the original file, search for QC, and see what pops up. Here are a couple of other examples of how those entity codes can play out. In each case, the green qualifier there is a, an active entity code that you might get. Uh, so that second line there with the IL, we've already talked a little bit about this. The IL indicates a subscriber. And sure enough, we can see subscriber information with the subscriber ID following. PR is for payer, and we can see a plan name. And 85 is a billing provider, and that is the billing provider uh, clinic information there. So if you were to get any others, 82, DN, these are all different types of qualifiers. You can look in the original file, see what kind of information follows it, and you probably have your answer right there. For the few times when that doesn't work, when, when they do not link up with a qualifier in the original file, uh, that's when this lookup tool is going to come in handy. There's a couple other code list resources you might need at some point or another. And uh, a lot of them, if possible, are going to be in the implementation guides themselves. So like place of service, they not only list where it goes, but they say here are the different possible place of service code types. Uh, there are some code lists, though, that are not maintained by X12. They, they are maintained and managed by other organizations, like zip codes and ICD-10 codes. 
And those are just going to be referenced in the appendix of each manual. So they'll say, you know, to get these codes, go out here. If you don't have implementation guides yet and you are doing a lot with X12, again, I highly recommend getting some implementation guides. And make sure you get one for each type of transaction that you're dealing with. Uh, you can get them out on the X12 store. Uh, they're not terribly expensive, uh, but you do have to purchase each transaction separately. At this point, I would like to open it up for questions. And uh, of course, if you have questions after the webinar ends, please feel free to use this contact information to reach out. We love uh, looking at X12 over here. It's kind of our thing. And also, I do want to encourage you guys real quickly to check out the webinar next month where we're going to go really deep dive into the 999 and the 277. So if you have questions, as a reminder, please use the chat function. It should be in the upper right corner of your WebEx. Just type it in and we'll read it out and answer it. A question came in about whether the slides will be available, and the answer is yes. Uh, we're going to, I'm happy to post the slides out with the video. So when you get that link in your email, just watch out for it. The same link will do for both pieces. All right, there was a question about how to identify the beginning of the transaction. Uh, depending on what you mean, there's a couple different ways that can play out. Uh, there's the header envelope section for each transaction. So there's going to be an ISA, and then within that there should be a GS, there should be an ST. The ST, if we're talking technically, is the beginning of the transaction set. Now, it is possible inside a single ST to have multiple claims within that. So if that's what you're talking about, you're going to be looking probably for an HL segment. It's just a hierarchical segment. Um, a hierarchical level is actually what that stands for. The HL segment uh, should be separating each claim within an ST to SE. If that doesn't answer your question, go ahead and submit another comment and I'll, I'll clarify. There was another question about, do we recommend any software to parse and or decipher the 835, 837, or 277 CA? I can't make a formal recommendation here. I can tell you that we have used uh, Clarity, which I believe has been rebranded to Optum Validation. Edifex is another common one. I'm sure there are others out there. There's actually, there's not more than a handful available. So any one of those handful, you're probably in good hands because they wouldn't be at the top of their game and, and in that arena at all if they weren't pretty good at what they were doing. Uh, there was a question about whether any of the software options are free. I am not aware of any. I think you're probably going to end up paying some kind of subscription for all of them. I know that we're technically over time, so I'm going to stop the recording, but I'm going to stay on the line for several minutes more in case other questions come in.